Okay, hello and welcome to Modes. This is our first ever show. I'm Rachel Premack, your host for today. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Modes, I started this newsletter in 2019 to really comment on what was happening in trucking. And since that fateful day four years ago in Chicago, um, when I started Modes, I really expanded the newsletter to be talking more about just the physical economy as a whole. So in recent months, I've talked about barges and rail and pet food and beer. So we're really just tackling everything going on um, in the economy and how it relates to freight and logistics. Um, so the first topic we're covering for the show today is how the supply chain crisis has led to what seems to be permanent inflation. Obviously, the 2021 supply chain crisis has passed. We don't have hundred something ships uh, waiting outside Long Beach, LA. Uh, but we're probably going to be seeing those price increases for, for forever, for the foreseeable future. And we've got a really great guest to talk more about this. His name is Adam Josephson. He led packaging and paper coverage at KeyBank for several years. And now he's our latest, newest, uh, greatest new employee here at Freight Waves uh, as our senior vertical ed- expert uh, covering packaging and paper. So, Adam, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So, Adam, you you know everything there is to know about paper and packaging. <laughs> and the, the really interesting segue to that is how it applies to consumer packaged goods. So, we've talked about beer and pet food and cardboard boxes and all these other sorts of interesting things in recent months. So tell us a little bit about how how inflation and how the supply chain crisis um, has led to this sort of inflation that we've seen, specifically looking at packaging and consumer packaged goods. Sure, of course. Well, it's it's an honor to be here. So thank you again. So inflation affected the food industry, as it did many others during the last two years, obviously the war in Ukraine particularly affected grains inflation and energy inflation. So that had a particular impact on food prices for a while. But you know, like many other industries, the, you know, the supply chain shortages coupled with the unprecedented stimulus and money printing globally led to this extraordinary in- inflation, uh, 40 year highs, not just in the US, but elsewhere. And so now the issue is how sticky will that inflation prove to be? And it depends on the industry at which you're looking. So you asked about food and, and CPG inflation, and so really grocery store inflation, if you will. And food prices tend to be pretty sticky. CPG companies are loath reduce prices, as are retailers, and food prices generally don't come down. You know, there there is promotional activity here and there, but food prices are upward biased, and I don't think this time will prove to be any different. Hmm. Why is it that food prices don't go down? I think we were talking yesterday about how, you know, the prices of new cars and used cars and homes, obviously those are all really volatile. Why don't why don't they just make the price of food a little bit cheaper now and then? <laughs> right, right. Well, it because people people consume it every day, and it, I mean, th- so when you think about the, what the Fed's doing, raising interest rates as it has, that is that has the most profound impact on the interest rate sensitive industries, notably housing and autos. And those happen to be the most expensive purchases that people make. So, you know, that combination of factors could lead to meaningful pressure on housing and auto prices. But when you're talking about food and beverage and and household products, we buy that stuff every day. We need it. In some cases, those industries are highly consolidated. So consumers don't have a great deal of choice in the matter. And that confluence of factors tends to lead to pretty sticky prices, even in recessionary periods. Hmm. And the the kind of increases we see in these food prices, I guess, let's take, for example, um, I'm trying to think of like a rand, like, I don't know, a box of Cheez-Its. I don't know why I picked a box of Cheez-Its of all things, but 
what it, it, it seems it seems like food prices, especially on those packaged goods, they're they're not with housing or autos that that goes up by several thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in some cases with housing. But it, it seems like with food prices, it's not really as noticeable to consumers until, you know, you realize your grocery bill that used to be $80 a week is now $110 a week. I guess talk a little bit about, like, yeah. how do food well, manufacturers yeah. go about raising these prices? Yeah, in, in normal a- times, obviously, the, the last two years were anything but normal times. But in normal times, there'll be typically low single-digit price increases on these products. And in some cases, it's not even a list price increase. There's there's a, a concept called shrinkflation, whereby producers will shrink the size of the package and keep the price the same. So those who are not paying particularly close attention to what they're buying don't even notice the fact that they're paying the same price for a smaller item. And it's through those methods that the CPG companies and the retailers are able to prop up prices, if you will. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, the shrinkflation is always really interesting. Just, I mean, uh, whenever I cook something that requires a can of beans, it always says a 15.5 ounce can. And it's, whenever I see them, I'm like, wait, do I have a 15.5 ounce can? But they're all 15.5 ounces instead of 16 ounces, which would make a lot more sense. But Alas, yeah. What are there any sort of really noticeable? What, what do you think have been sort of the biggest um, shrinkflation offenders in the last few years that you've noticed, or wh- where where have you really noticed a lot of the shrinkflation and inflation more generally in the food food and beverage world? Well, you may not be asking the perfect person because I don't cook too much. I lived in New York for much of the past. <laughs> 10 years, so I'm not, and I'm not particularly good in the kitchen. But think of cereal. Cereal is the most obvious example that the, 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 the size of the boxes has shrunk over time. And again, those who shop daily or twice a week, whatever the case may be, those people tend to notice, but many others don't. And so the likes of General Mills and Kellogg and Post and others can kind of get away with this. And when people are particularly strapped, as is the case today in many segments of the population, people do notice this. And everyone's acutely aware of, of inflation now. But, but those are the way. So I would point to cereal as a good example, I'm sure. Cookies are, are another. You know, many center of the store item. You mentioned uh, food cans. Many center of the store items that would pertain to. And that doesn't mean that every manufacturer can pull this off, but if the brand is good enough and demand for that product is really inelastic, then manufacturers can get away with this. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there is a there is a really interesting substack. Uh, Sam Rowe writes this great uh, economics substack called T Care, and he, he in a recent piece he wrote about just this idea of consumer consumers fighting back, not putting up with this sort of inflation. Um, but it, as you mentioned, with corporate consolidation, it's not quite as easy to just say, okay, I'm not going to buy cereal anymore from Post because then, okay, I guess your option is General Mills. You kind of run out of options in terms of how to stage this, you know, consumer fight back and and revolution. You're right. As with many industries in the U.S., food and beverage industries and household products industries tend to be highly consolidated. So think of beer as as an example. Now, the ABN Bev and Molson Coors and Constellation I don't have the figures handy because I didn't cover beer specifically, but those three companies, along with Sam Adams, which is a Boston beer company, you know, it's a select few companies account for a very substantial share of the U.S. beer market. So who has an incentive to lower prices or to not raise prices in line with where everyone else is raising prices? You know, that applies to energy drinks, soda. Uh, many food categories, household products categories, you name it. 
So it's you see this in many industries, and and food and beverage is no exception. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So if you and, if, and- if you like think of it, if you go to a convenience store and you're looking for beer, how many options do you really have? Yeah. Yeah. And then, then there's, well, there's craft beer, but those tend to be more expensive than the, than the, uh, well, than the, ex- you know, exactly right. Brands. And, and it, and craft beer is not nearly as prevalent in certain parts of the country as it is on the East coast and West coast, for example. Right. Right. Well, it's, it's huge in Michigan now, every random <laughs> town in Michigan has a craft brewery. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, gen- especially, you know, going to a, like a 7-Eleven and a lot of those, I think a lot of those craft labels have actually been acquired by um, large brewers as well. Uh, um, Blue Moon. Think of Blue Moon. Yeah. That's Molson Coors. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, that's not even an option. Something we've talked a little bit about in the past is this idea of private label and beer is actually a perfect example of private label because there's there's no private label. There's no like Walgreens <laughs> brand oh, here. Although Walgreens, if you're listening, maybe you should look into that. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you, you I feel like you, you track private label growth really closely. And it's always really interesting because it seems like the growth of private label shows a lot about consumer sentiment. You know, if, if, if the consumer is doing well, maybe they'll spring for actual Cheerios. But, you know, in tough times, maybe they'll go for the Walmart brand green circles or whatever, however they, they call it. Um, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about private label and how, um, sure. what that shows about this inflationary time we're in. Yeah, no, absolutely. So one of the companies that I used to write research on is a private label tissue manufacturer called Clearwater Paper. It's a publicly traded company, one of the largest private label tissue manufacturers in the country. And every quarter that they've been reporting, they've been saying private label share of the U.S. tissue market just hit a new all-time high. And I think as of the most recent quarter, as of the fourth quarter, the private label share of the tissue market hit 35.5% if memory serves. And when I I say tissue, I mean toilet paper, uh, 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 Kleenex, uh, Kleenex. why am I blanking? Uh, paper towels. Uh, yeah. yeah, paper towels, exactly. Or napkins, was, maybe. Uh, had, had a brain fart. Napkins, all <laughs> that stuff. So, so tissues, all the above. So it, the, in certain categories in which private label, uh, which people are not averse to using any brand, private label share has grown significantly. And in some cases, as I said, is at an all-time high. It depends entirely on the category, though. So. Think milk, bread, paper products. People buy whatever milk they see. They'll buy whatever paper products they see in many cases. But in other other categories, think chocolate, confectionery, you don't see a whole lot of private label there. So Mm -hmm. those are categories in which prices tend to go up a lot because if someone wants to buy a bar of chocolate or a pack of gum or some you know, things to suck on, there just aren't too many options. You don't see Kirkland brand gum or, or cough drops or, or, uh, or chocolate. You just don't. So, so the private label penetration varies greatly by category, but as a general statement, private label share has certainly been growing and it always does in recessionary periods, such as the one we're in today, so I would fully expect private label penetration to continue rising in the months ahead. That's really interesting that there's certain categories that are really exposed to private label and those that are not. I mean, yeah, the idea of a, you know, Whole Foods does have a really good chocolate bar that's their private label brand, but I don't know if that's exactly what we're talking about here. I don't know if I would necessarily go for you know, a Walmart, the Walmart Twix knockoff. That sounds maybe not like something I'd, I'd be super into. Um, but yeah, with no tissues, I don't care. It's just, you know, it it Red. comes out of a cow. I can blow my nose on it. I don't well, really care. And per- particularly given the cost of everything now, 
if you have a choice, yeah. why wouldn't you get just get the store brand bread or milk? What do you care? What yeah. what difference does it make? Now, when it comes to tissue, that can be different. Some people are more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, some people are more picky about the type of tissue yeah. and toilet paper that they use. But but generally speaking, you know, a, a tissue is a tissue is a tissue. Uh, but that that uh, that does not apply to confectionery, broadly speaking. That's really interesting. It's I remember last year, I think in December, there was this big news story about how one of the, like, I forget which company it was or which, you know, analytics firm it was, but they tracked the hottest brands of 2022, like which brands had the most, the most growth. And one of them was, was the Walmart brand cream cheese because people can't afford, you know, the Philadelphia cream cheese or they, or maybe they just if they're going to save money, they're going to save it on this dairy product where it's kind of all the same at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, looking at private label and how it reflects the larger consumer is super interesting. Now, you mentioned well, that I, at this point, your water paper has 35% of the consumer market um, in the tissue world. What is that during normal times? Like what, what kind of market share do they uh, typically claim if it's not, uh, right. you know, everything's going fine. It, just to be clear, they don't have 35% of the market. Okay. What, what they, were, they were talking about, according to either IRI data or Nielsen data, that private label now accounts for over 35% of the entire okay. category in the U.S. Uh, you okay. know, they're, they're one of the larger private label producers, but private label... Again, it's about a third of the industry, a little more than that now. The uh, okay. question is, how, what do you compare to that 35% to? I don't, you know, I haven't looked at the Nielsen data. So I don't know five years ago, 10 years ago, what whether it was 30%, 32%, exactly what it was. And th these are slow movements. You don't, you don't see these huge shifts over the course of a year or two. But I would venture to guess that 10 years ago, if private label share today is 35%, it was probably 30% or a bit lower than that. Okay. Interesting. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's I feel like we've been talking a lot in the last few months about where the consumer kind of goes from now. Um, you know, you've mentioned one kind of key way that uh one kind of key key way to look at, you know, how the consumer is doing is, of course, by kind of these metrics that maybe aren't talked about very often, like looking at what kind of private label, how much private label they're buying. You did a really interesting study uh, for the site last week about how all this federal stimulus cash affected freight volumes. Um, now that we're seeing now that, of course, those major checks aren't getting sent to people's homes anymore and we yep. are no longer, uh, you know, a lot of these other sorts of stimulus packages are getting rolled back with, uh, you know, rolling back on these sorts of food stamps or rolling back on uh, student loan debt repayment. It seems like we're going to see more and more the, the consumer market, you know, continue to shrink. I guess I'm wondering, why do you think it is that you know, we've had, you know, interest rates increase, you know, stimulus packages kind of cut off, but the consumer still somehow remains somewhat strong. Like they, you know, they, they, they haven't completely given up on buying. People are still buying these incredibly expensive, you know, plane tickets. What do you think it's going to take to slow down the consumer? That, that, that's a broad question. I, I think yeah. the consumer. <laughs> I guess everyone wants I, I mean, to know think, that. <laughs> I, that, that 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 boy, there's a there's a there's, a, there's a, I could go many ways there. I, the consumer has slowed, I mean, mm -hmm. pretty dramatically, depending on which figures you look at. I mean, look at you and I have talked about this. Look at where credit card debt is in this country. It's at an all time high, despite the fact that credit card rates are above twenty percent. This, despite the fact that there has been mortgage loan forbearance, student loan forbearance. There have been all as part of all the COVID programs that you and I just talked about. 
So even with all of the money that the government gave us, credit card debt is already back at an all-time high, and it's grown dramatically in just the last two quarters. And we've talked about the fact that credit card delinquencies are clearly on the rise again, as are auto loan delinquencies. So there are clear signs of building stress. I mean, very clear. And so I don't think that the consumer is nearly as strong as I mean, you can find anecdotal evidence of, oh, I went to the DFW and it was jammed and my flight was jammed and the hotel room rates were crazy high. We can all find anecdotes of that. But broadly speaking, there are clear signs of stress at the consumer level. Think about what Walmart and Target have been saying for the last year. They're talking about the shift from spending on discretionary items, what they call general merchandise, which are things like apparel furniture, electronics, et cetera, to spending on what they call essentials, which is food, drinks, toothpaste, you name it. The the largest retailers in the country have been saying that for a year. And that's why Walmart and Target and many other retailers were caught completely off guard a year ago. They found themselves with way too much inventory because they had all this inventory of furniture, clothing, electronics, for which there was no demand because people started to shift their budgets more toward essential items and away from anything that they consider discretionary. And that that has continued to this day. Hmm. And what are packaging companies saying at this point? I think you you mentioned yesterday that, or yesterday you had mentioned that there is one, you know, paper firm that announced kind of unexpectedly good earnings or pre-announced unexpectedly right. good earnings. What's going on with the packaging world? Because we see some companies come out with these great earnings. There's, you know, Wall Street's happy, so on and so forth. But it seems like overall it's a it's 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 not well, you know, all sunshine but, and rainbows for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean when when it, you have to be careful when you're looking at earnings reports because in some cases you're talking about they they reported X EPS compared to whatever the consensus expectation was. But this doesn't just apply to my sector, but everywhere. There's often a game that's played whereby companies will talk down expectations throughout the quarter or throughout the year and then beat that lowered number because they themselves are basically talking down that expectation. So you have to be careful when just looking at, oh, how did a, how did a company do on adjusted EPS versus consensus or versus guidance for that matter. In the case of the the example you just mentioned, a company called Sunoco Products just positively pre-announced its first first quarter earnings uh, a couple nights ago. They attributed the beat to basically lower costs, combination of a restructuring program that they already had underway and lower than expected input costs, such as natural gas. I mean, look at U.S. natural gas prices. They are historically low after having skyrocketed over the past year or two. So companies are benefiting, in some cases, from historically low input costs. And many companies have cost-cutting programs underway in response to what has been very weak demand over the past year. So Hmm. I, I wouldn't necessarily read too much into some company or another beating expectations on earnings per share, a lo- almost every company that I was covering was embarked on, had embarked on some kind of cost-cutting program in response to what had been weak demand. Boxes are the best economic indicator of anything in paper packaging. That's what I spent more of my time on than anything. And as you know, box demand got... Uh, progressively weaker throughout last year, and the fourth quarter was a disaster. And Mm. the box companies were hoping that the first quarter box demand would be better sequentially, but by all accounts, it hasn't been. Mm. And obviously, there are many parallels between box demand and trucking demand. You and I and, and Craig and everyone else have talked about this, that it's driven by the same thing, which is demand for goods in this country. And demand for goods is... No bueno. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, and we are unfortunately out of time, even though I have, I have more questions to ask you, but unfortunately <laughs> we've got to wrap it up. I think this was a great first episode of Modes. I'm so glad that you could join me for it. And yes, Thank you tune, for in, me. tune in. Thanks so much, guys. Stop.